Hey guys, Garrett here. Today is part two of my DIY geothermal series. If you missed part one, it is right here. It'll be in the description. You can click that link. But today in part two, we're gonna talk about two different things trenches as well as soil temperature. First, let's talk about those soil temperatures. They get very interesting and they get very technical, so I'm gonna keep this as simple as possible. If you get to a depth of 30 feet or more, the soil temperature is unaffected by the outside temperature, the air temperature. But if it is less than 30 feet, it is affected by the air temperature outside. So in my area, my mean ground temperature, so that would be between 30 and 50 feet deep, is roughly 60 degrees. And if you're in the United States and you're wondering what yours is as well, the very first link in the description has a great map of the United States with contour lines and different areas to show you exactly what the temperature of your soil is. Something to think about with the earth temperature is that it varies depending on your latitude. So the more southern you are, the mean ground temperature is going to be higher. The more northern you are, it's actually going to be lower. But again, if it's at least 30 feet deep or more, it's going to be very consistent. So the northern United States, the ground temperature is probably in the 40s. The southernmost of the United States, it's gonna be in the 70s. But if you're gonna be building a geothermal system, especially a closed loop system, you're probably not gonna be 30 feet deep. It's just too much work to get down to that depth. It is nice, you get very, very consistent soil temperatures, but you just don't have to. So I made this graph right over here to kind of show you the differences of uh, temperature at depth. If we're to look at temperatures at different depths as well as the ground temperature, all right, so we look at this. On the side here, we've got the ground temperature and then we have the months. So we're gonna assume that the area that we are in is 62 degrees. And that's this black line going all the way across. This black curve right here is actually the ground temperature at ground level. And you'll notice it hits its low temperature around January, February, really it's the beginning of February, and then hits its high temperature in August, usually early August. Well, if you get to this next one, which is this purple line, which is two feet deep, you can tell that the amplitude of this curve is actually starting to flatten out. And that's kind of one of the big takeaways with this. The deeper you get, the flatter the curve is and the less temperature change there is over time. If you look at the red line, which is five feet deep, again, it's starting to flatten out. Those lows are not so low and those highs are not so high. If you look at this blue line right here, that is 12 feet deep. And there's not a lot of difference between the low or the high. But there's another thing to look at here. As you can see that each one of these lines, the peak of it is actually moving out further each time. If you look at this black line versus this purple line, the peak is actually spread out two weeks. So same with the low, it is two weeks later. If you look at this red line, it would actually go about another three weeks beyond that. So then if you look at this blue line, which is the 12 foot, the deepest one, it's high is actually in late October to early November, whereas the ground temperature high is in early August. So again, you not only flatten out this curve, but you actually move the peak temperatures further down. Well, why is this important? Well, if the peak temperature for the ground is hitting around November and staying pretty consistent through December and January, that's the highest that ground temperature is going to be, and that's gonna be usually the coldest times that you're going to have, that you're gonna be heating your home. Same deal with cooling of your home. I live in Kansas, and so we see very cold winters as well as really hot summers. So if the low of the ground temperature is hitting me in May and staying pretty consistent through June and July, those are really hot months for me, but the ground temperature is at its fairly lowest point. So the deeper you go, the further you move that curve over. And the better that curve then aligns up for when you need that heat. So I put mine in at 10 feet because that was the limits of my machine. 
And then that would put me to where the peak of uh, the temperature high would be in, say, probably mid-October, something like that. And the low would be somewhere in April. But if you're going at shallower depths, you're not taking advantage of those shifted curves. And if you're really shallow, there is a lot of difference between this temperature, say at five feet in the peak of the summer, as well as the the low in the winter. That's a big difference that your HVAC system has to compensate for. So in my opinion, the deeper the better, the more consistent the ground temperature, and again, it shifts those curves over into more useful periods. All right, let's talk about the different layouts for your closed loop system. Now, if you have a big pond, you can put your loops in that pond. And I'm gonna qualify that as a minimum of an acre and a minimum of 10 to 12 feet deep. Otherwise, it's gonna be too small. You're gonna overwhelm that pond. And then if you have any fish in there, you're gonna kill them. But if your pond is big enough and it is deep enough, you'll be able to handle your heating and cooling needs. As I mentioned in the last video, to me, anything that is a vertical uh, closed loop system isn't really DIY. You're gonna have to have someone that's gonna come out and drill wells, so again, it's not DIY. So I'm really just talking about horizontal systems. So if we look at our whiteboard right here, obviously we have our house and then we have our loops go out to the different trenches. Here we're gonna assume that there's three different trenches. So there's really two different ways that you can do horizontal that is pretty DIY and these are the ways that I would recommend. Number one, you could lay out that line, just string it all the way out. Let's say it's 600 feet long, so you'd be roughly 300 feet out and then 300 feet back. And you'd wanna keep a separation between those two lines of at least two feet. And then from loop to loop, you want a 10 foot separation. So 10 foot here and 10 foot there. Laying your pipes out like this is going to be really efficient, but it takes a lot more land area and it's gonna take some extra time. So if you're doing this with an excavator, you're probably doing more than you really need to do. Unless you have say a two or a three foot bucket, you can just dig one big long trench run the line on one side of the trench and then back on the other side of the trench and then you've got your minimum of two feet of separation. But those are really long trenches and who really wants to dig 300 foot long trenches. Another way you could do it is by using a trencher. And they do make pretty good sized trenchers that can get five to six feet down. And if you determine that's good enough depth for you, that'd be a great way to go. Just trench out and trench back. And trenchers aren't that terribly expensive. I looked in my own area and I could get a trencher for a week for about 1200 bucks. So it's not that expensive. Or if it's just gonna be for a day, you know, you're looking at 300 and some dollars for that day. But if you're doing really long trenches like this, 300 feet out and back, you basically have to do six times. So 300 foot out and then back, out and then back, out and then back. And that takes a lot of time, so budget the time. The slinky type system is what I ended up using. This is where you put a bunch of coils out and then run a straight all the way back works really well, it's exactly what I used, and it allows you to actually shorten up those trenches. Mine ended up being 120 feet long, and I used a two foot wide bucket, so I laid my, my coils out in that. While it's not quite as efficient as if you were just to run your line all the way out and then all the way back, it's still very efficient, and so I make up for that with depth. I buried my coils 10 feet deep, and of course I put a minimum of 10 foot separation between each coil. Remember that the deeper you get, the more consistent the ground temperature, usually the moisture content is higher and the density of the soil is higher, which results in higher thermal conductivity. The higher the thermal conductivity, the better off you're going to be. So in my opinion, deeper is better. I'll make another video showing you exactly how to coil your loops the proper way to do it. Expect that as either part three or part four of this series. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the trenches. And again, trenches can be very, very hazardous. If you saw my thumbnail, lots of warnings, all that kind of stuff. Don't get in your trenches. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what to do as far as trench safety goes because I don't wanna put myself liable for your trenches. But 
Follow OSHA standards, whether they say you need trench boxes or trench shoring or, or you just dig a trench and uh, you don't get in it, you know. Follow what makes sense. Just beware that trenches are very dangerous and if a trench collapses on you, it's going to kill you. With that out of the way, let's dive a little deeper. Remember with the soils, I told you not to have rocky soils. And the main reason for that is you don't want those rocks to puncture the pipes that you're burying. And if you're putting in pipes, they're usually either going to be HDPE, which is high density polyethylene, or PEX-A. You cannot use PEX-B or PEX-C. It has to be PEX-A. My loops were made with 3 quarter inch HDPE SDR-11. So SDR-11 signifies the thickness of that pipe. The thicker the pipe, the more puncture resistant the whole thing is going to be, but also the more rigid it's going to be. So if you're doing coils and you have a really thick pipe, you're gonna have a heck of a time making those coils because it's going to be so rigid. But if you're doing the uh, all the way out where you're just laying the pipe out and laying it back, it's gonna be just fine. If you do come across rocky soils, again, I would say put at least six inches to a foot of really good clean soil in your, your trench before you lay your pipe inside of it. And then at least another six to 12 inches worth of clean soil on top of it. Again, you don't want to puncture those pipes. And if you run into a situation where you just keep digging down and it's just dry, 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 you have a couple of options here. You're not completely stuck. Number one, if you have a septic system, put your loops underneath that septic system. That septic system is always going to be hydrating the soil above your loops. And of course, gravity carries that moisture down and it's going to keep your loops nice and moist. Just make sure that your local jurisdiction will allow you to do that. If you don't have a septic system, you can always put in some sort of an alternative watering system. So let's say you put your, your pipes 10 feet down and then you backfill, say four feet up, and then you could bury some pipes. You drill holes in those pipes to where then you pump water into the pipes. It allows the water then to seep over those trenches, keeping your coils nice and moist. Another scenario is you dig down, you make it four feet deep, and you're trying to hit eight or 10 feet or something like that, and you just hit a rock shelf. You have options there too. You can either break out that rock shelf, which is gonna be way too much time and energy and expense, or you can fill over those trenches. So you bury it, say three to four feet deep, and then you put a bunch of fill on top of those trenches and you get your depth at that point. There's almost always a way to make this whole system work. All right, the last thing that we're gonna to cover today is what happens with those loops whenever they come back. So as you can see, I have basically like a main line going here that connects into each one and then another main line that connects into the other side of the pipe. Well, usually what happens is, uh, say these are three quarter inch lines, you'd run either an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half line out there and connect these lines to it, kind of a manifold system. Or you would just have a little extra of this line come to a very common spot where all of them come in and again, put a little manifold system in. And usually that manifold is going to be an HDPE manifold and it's going to be fused to those pipes. And that's very important. You want those to be fused. You don't want mechanical joints underneath your earth or you run the risk of leakage. In my case, I actually ran all of the loops into my house. So every single one. So if I had three sets of loops, I actually had six sets of pipe that came into my house. And while I had to drill more holes to make that possible, I then made my manifold inside the house and I could control any leakage that there was at that manifold system. I didn't have a way to fuse those pipes. I was gonna to have to hire someone to do it and I kept calling around and I could find nobody that would do that for me. So I was stuck just putting them through my house and making the manifold myself. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to follow this series, like it and subscribe. I'll see you next time.